Okay, I'm Clarissa Trapp, and um, the, the paper that I'll be reading is um, part of my preliminary ideas for my master's thesis at Colorado State University. Um, and so I'll be focusing mostly on one source, but I'll start by explaining a little bit about um, the theoretical ideas that I'll be using to explore this kind of stuff. So, uh, in her 2000 book, excuse me, 2009 book, Foul Bodies, Kathleen Brown claimed that domestic life is a historical and constantly changing site of cultural production. So focusing on the importance of cleanliness in early America, Brown demonstrated women's growing responsibility for cultural production through the increased gendering of body care tasks, like specifically textile production, laundry, and bathing by the beginning of the 19th century. Women performed the work necessary for clean and healthy bodies in part because their nation called them to be what Linda Kerber has termed Republican mothers devoted to producing healthy, virtuous citizens to populate the nascent United States of America. At the same time that women were asked to take on larger responsibilities for families' cleanliness, other aspects of their health-related domestic duties also changed and became more strongly gendered. Traditionally, American women had fed and healed their families with plants from their kitchen gardens and knowledge learned by word of mouth and through handwritten receipt books. However, by the turn of the 19th century, male doctors touting the importance of education and intent on professionalizing the American medical practice vilified midwives and female healing as superstitious and dangerous. Education proved a powerful, powerful persuader and consulting with educated doctors made increasing sense to some women who began to defer to male physicians. Labor-intensive tasks, such as cooking and nursing, continued to be the purview of women, but diagnosis and treatment of serious diseases were more often men's responsibilities. In much the same way that demands of raising a virtuous, healthy citizenry required mothers to embrace stricter standards of bodily cleanliness, they also demanded that mothers reconsider their children's food and medical care in light of the future health of the nation. Many advice books devoted to infant care informed mothers that infants' food had national consequences, and they universally stressed that medical and nutritional benefits of breastfeeding. Decrying the use of wet nurses and the elite women who used them, writers increasingly insisted that only a mother's milk and attention could produce the bodies a healthy nation required. While many published and unpublished sources discussed the merits of breastfeeding in the 18th and 19th centuries, I will confine this discussion to one particular source, which is Mary Palmer Tyler's The Maternal Physician, a treatise on the nurture and management of infants from birth until two years old, being the result of 16 years experience in the nursery. Um, most um, titles at this time are really, really long. This is one of those. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so this was published anonymously as the work of an American matron in 1811. Uh, we know that she actually wrote it because her husband was a famous playwright, Royal Tyler, and um, scholars of Royal Tyler discovered her as the, the writer of this work in the uh, early 1900s. Anyway, uh, Tyler proves an unusual female perspective in a genre, infant care advice literature, that was dominated by men at the time. Um, further, Tyler wrote the maternal physician because she believed that mother's actions possessed national consequences. The United States of America depended on future guardians who possessed courage, strength, and activity that mothers helped to instill. According to Tyler, conscientious mothers fulfilled their maternal duties by keeping their children clean and clothed in loose garments while feeding their infants sweet, salubrious streams of milk from their own breasts. Tyler directed her book's instructions to educated women, who in the early 19th century were mostly elite women whose sweet, salubrious streams of milk poured from breasts of snow, as she called it. Women with white breasts had access to opportunities and knowledge from which women with black and brown breasts were excluded, and though the excluded women's breasts might nurse white children, a lack of education, amongst other things, disqualified them from proper motherhood in the United States. Not all white women were educated, but Tyler believed that educated mother could act as a benevolent matron and instructor to other mothers living in filth, indigence, and sorrow, and at the mercy of superstition. The problem, Tyler claimed, was that elite white women were often leaving their infants in the care of hired nurses in order to attend parties and refused to breastfeed because of fashion. 
The women best suited to ensuring the well-being of the nation's children were serving their duties to, preserve, to pursue frivolities. Tyler proved a tireless crusader for breastfeeding, and in her opinion, the benefits were twofold. First, breast milk was the very best medicine for infants. Throughout the maternal physician, Tyler restated popular arguments at the time for breast milk's nutrition and medical benefits. Um, quoting medical author William Buchan, she wrote on the benefits of colostrum, the first milk an infant can draw is the best medicine in the world to cleanse its little stomach and bowels of the matter acquired in the womb. Adding, I have never had the least occasion to use any other medicine for my babes. <laughs> Breast milk was a properly light and nutritious food and all other thicker foods like pernicious pap and bread clogged the first passages. Tyler also promoted Enlightenment ideals about natural childhood development, claiming that breast milk was natural, as was the process by which bodies produced and consumed that milk. God had created a natural order in which instinct and the larger animal kingdom showed that females could and should nurse their babies. I have often been vexed, she declared, with physicians who, while they exhort us to follow nature, adopt the absurd notion that a mother cannot endure the fatigue of suckling her own child. Further, nursing mothers should not impose rigid nursing schedules. In order to keep young bodies healthy, women's bodies and breasts needed to be available to the less predictable but very natural desires of infant stomachs. Breastfeeding's second benefit was that it allowed women opportunities to closely monitor tiny children's bodies for signs of health or sickness. In the maternal physician, Tyler championed educated mothers' authority to doctor their own children, counseling her readers that a mother is her child's best physician in all ordinary cases. Mothers made the best physicians because only a mother could possibly feel interest enough in a helpless newborn babe to pay at the unwearied, uninterrupted attention necessary to detect disease lurking in its tender frame. Tyler harshly criticized women who refused to nurse their children, maintaining that the best pleasures of a woman's life were found in the faithful discharge of her maternal duties, and she worried that children would die if mothers neglected their duties and infants received foods other than breast milk or were sent away to unsupervised wet nurses. She therefore urged women to undergo everything short of death or lasting disease rather than refuse to suckle her child. Status and delicate education gave no exemption because even as Tyler encouraged elite women to engage in increased body care labor, she insisted that breastfeeding was, quote, not a labor, unquote, but, quote, exquisite delight, unquote. For Tyler, the ball, the concert, and the play could not compare to the pleasures of caring for her children. Damages to a woman's body incurred while nursing, like painful cracked nipples, infections, and fatigue, were nothing compared to an infant's well-being. Women's physical sacrifices for their children were not sacrifices. Added labor was really no labor at all. A woman who neglected her prime maternal duty to her own child was ungrateful, prideful, and selfishly ruled by fashion, and worse, was not half a mother. Tyler begrudgingly admitted that nursing an infant might be impossible for some women in ill health whose bodies fail to produce milk. She suggested that they obtain the services of a wet nurse to perform the necessary feeding, but she cautioned that the nurse should be brought into the home. At home, a mother can maintain physical proximity with her child in order to pay every attention requisite to its health, while making sure that the nurse correctly discharged her tasks. Monitoring the nurse was essential to discharging motherly duties, and Tyler referred her readers to William Roscoe's poem, The Nurse, to make her point. I don't know if any of you are familiar with it. Thank you. Okay. Unobserved, an untrustworthy wet nurse might feed a baby thick breast milk or a natural food and miss signs of sickness. Um, in fact, in the poem, in Roscoe's poem, troubles and death befell the family who employed the greedy, careless nurse. So just one day in the care of a stranger could bring an infant's life to an end, Tyler warned. According to Tyler, raising healthy, properly fed children brought mother's rewards later in life, such as the true gratitude of a child, or knowing that one had discharged her duty to her country. But Tyler's advocacy of breastfeeding could be indicative of her participation in another conversation with her contemporaries. Uh, Susan Klepp's recent book, Revolutionary Conceptions, discussed the, dis 
the decision by American families in the early republic to limit the size of their families, uh, suggesting that in keeping with the ideals of educated republican motherhood, many women exercised prudence and restraint in the number of children that they bore. One method that women used to delay birth of subsequent children was prolonged breastfeeding. Perhaps Tyler's insistence on breastfeeding could have had something to do with a desire to limit family size. Uh, Tyler did not address family planning directly, but historians know that many of Tyler's contemporaries understood the connection between nursing and delaying subsequent pregnancies. At the time of the maternal physician's publication, the 35-year-old Tyler had borne eight children over the course of 16 years. She, um, excuse me, she promoted weaning infants when they reached nine months of age, which, while not a particularly lengthy period of time, had allowed her to space births every 18 to 24 months instead of almost every year. Readers might have seen in Tyler's emphasis on breastfeeding for the health and development of their children a guide for successfully delaying their own pregnancies and the increase in body labor that accompanied every new baby. So while Tyler insisted that the joys of infant care erased any burdens, excuse me, any burdensome labor associated with a mother's duties, the maternal physician repeatedly called women, especially elite women, at the turn of the 19th century to assume a greater burden of infant body care. For the sake of their children's lives and the future of the United States, selfless mothers needed to abandon less intimate methods of feeding and medical care and bear their breasts to the country's infants. Only sweet, salubrious streams of mother's milk could produce healthy, virtuous citizens. <laughs>